said that we were the best town for, for history of the buildings in Lincolnshire. And when I was told this, I thought, oh dear, he hasn't been to Stamford, for instance, has he? Um, but I think I know what he means, because he was quite taken by the 18th century properties that we have. And we must treasure them, indeed. And, okay, so that's what I've chosen uh, for tonight. But before I launch off in Gainsborough, let us just look at the 18th century in context, historical context. What was going on, in other words, in the world outside Gainsborough? Because Gainsborough was not in a bubble. We, we live in a bubble if we, if we are not careful. And of course, the first person here is Adam Smith, a Scot. We won't have to hold that against him, will we? Um, but he had a marvellous brain, and of course he was influential in uh, the understanding of modern economy. And of course the, um, his influence still pervades um, uh, the economy, the influence of the economy to this day. But he was very influential. Then you've got David Hume, the great philosopher, we could argue and pull out, but uh, on this occasion, he believed in a kind of empirical way of looking at the world. Everything had to be by experience and, and so forth. And that was quite influential. Remember, this is the age of reason. We got over the civil wars, uh, no conflict with Charles I and all the rest of it. And so we've got it, the, the age of reason coming in. And look at the Georges look. George I. He was German, but of course on his grandmother's side he was a Stuart. Sophia is the daughter of James I, Sixth of Scotland, um, married into the German house, and their daughter married uh, uh, his, his mother was Elizabeth, um, and um, he was able with his Protestant uh, uh, faith to succeed to the British crown. And then you've got George II, and look at Ramsey's beautiful picture of George III. Certainly, you know, very, very. And the Georges, of course, were throughout the whole of the 18th century, and we will come back to them in a little while. And here you've got in the 18th century a fallout with our American cousins, and when you see Mr. Trump, you think, well, we did a good thing, you know, on the help. And here you've got George Washington, looks very proud and all the rest of it. And of course we lost the American colonies, or rather we let them win. And <laughs> General Wolfe, who, in, it's very interesting, because we lost, as it were, the, the American, just before we lost the American, we had rediscovered our other empire, Canada. And of course, General Wolfe uh, died heroically, like Nelson. All good leaders die in the process, don't they? And um, he, he managed to secure Canada for us. And of course, the big, the, the real thing of the, the, the 18th century to the end was the end of the Bourbon monarchy. At the end of the 18th century, there they're holding up Louis's head. And of course, we've experienced that in. <coughs> In, in 1649, on the 30th of January, with Charles I. And um, that had repercussions throughout, and of course, the, uh, we're not very far from the uh, end of the Romanovs, 100 years, in 2017. Um, that event was earth shattering for the monarchies of Europe. And the other thing that, uh, 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 to put it in context, is that we have the River Trent, and we have um, people uh, improving our communications, and in this case we've got James Brindley, and this is the West Stockbridge Basin because of the Chesterfield Canal, which fed into Chesterfield, Derbyshire, and so forth. And this is important because the River Trent is what I call the M1, um, for us at the, at the, in this particular period of time, 
and any offshoots like the canal system and so forth is only going to improve communication that is for business and trade and all the rest of it. And for, because the 18th century was a flourishing one economically and so forth. So when we talk about Gainsborough and the beautiful buildings we have and so forth, we've always got to think what sustained them, what moved them, what drove them, and it was the upturn in the economy, which of course we um, want for our own economy at this present time. And interestingly enough, Parliament is in a bit of a mess building wise, I mean, and uh, they're going to have to move out because the building is in an awful state, as you well know. But interestingly, all the stone for the Houses of Parliament came this way to the Chesterfield Canal down to, to, to London. But that is another story. And of course, the canal system now with the barges, lovely holidays, etc., etc. But this, you know, the canal system was not built for lovely holidays, it was built for graft. Uh, to keep trade going and improve trade and so forth. But you can't help but fall in love with the picturesque scenes of the canal system that we've inherited since it is Drake Coles, which isn't that far away, is it? So they're, they're lovely. And this man <coughs> also was, um, uh, this is a period of prosperity, and here is. John Carr of York. He was uh, the architect for quite a few houses in this area. Remember, I'm just dealing with context at the moment. And John Carr designed Norton Place, which is near Cady Corner, just beyond. Um, lovely house, great one. One of his best houses. And hit the grounds were laid out by a student of capability Brown. And Norton Place had a tremendous role in the uh, Hemshelter Hill Farm, which was over a year ago, the great inquiry, because of course you'd have eight to ten, if not twelve, wind turbines fairly close to that building. And um, we used that card in, in the proceedings to overturn uh, the whole of the application which we succeeded. Do you recognise that? Building on the castle that was built by James York. Lovely building. The Rose family are there. It was built for the Ray family at Blentworth. Before that, there's the Ray clerk of it. This is Kate Burton, but not by car. And there's the chateau. That is Hackthorpe, not a car, not Sir James Carr. And that is Legworm, or Hall. And that is Glentworth, that is a car, a car on Glentworth Hall. In actual fact, it should have another story to it, but they took it down. Well, the modern owners <coughs> took it down, and that's what we're left with. However, from a distance, it looks beautiful. And a lot of work has been done on these. These are the stables, again by car, and they're lovely. And uh, I, uh, this is not by car, but it's an 18th century property, and it is, of course, Eckwood, the rectory at Eckwood, which I think is a glorious building, indeed. Um, a different angle, but it, it is lovely. And, of course, we've, this is by James Carr, but we've got Morton Hall, um, um, isn't it strange, it's all property developers. They don't live in houses that they build themselves, but they seek out lovely ones that live in their homes. <laughs> um, and uh, a property developer lives in there. And there's another view. And then I come to, um, I'm still in context by the way, um, because the 18th century, although it was growing uh, in economy wise and so forth, it was like our own period of time. It was rather fragile at times. And this church is Hartsell. And there's a, <coughs> a commemoration there for the clock. This is Hartsell. And 
the Whitcates, who were at um, Hartsville, um, did not support the Jacobite rebellion in 1735. And of course, Bonnie Prince Charlie lost, the last of the Stuarts, as it were, and he commemorated by having a clock and a memorial put up to celebrate the fact that the Hanoverian succession was secure, because of course it was Protestant and all the rest of it. And, <clears throat> and so every time I go past Hartsville, I not only admire that beautiful church tower, but I think, ooh, you know, the Hanoverian succession. And here we've got a, a, a portrait by Ramsey who painted George III of Billy Bobby Prince Charlie. That has only been rediscovered in the last 12 months, which is absolutely sensational um, indeed. So this period of time is one of great flux. I mean, George III actually was, had got his bags packed, ready to leave England, because he actually did believe that Bonnie Prince Charlie, who had a greater claim to the throne, was going to usurp him, and he was ready to go back to, to Germany, as it were. Um, but anyway, things turned out very differently for Bonnie and Prince. And here we've got <coughs> some pictures of the portraits. This is um, Neville Hickman. And this is his wife, and, and these lived um, at Thurnock. Um, in 1720, they didn't want to live here. Um, it's a wieldy building for various reasons. It's not very good to keep warm. And houses were being built very differently. It was very old-fashioned, which it is. And they decided that they would go to Thurnock which they purchased 50% of that estate. Now they purchased the other 50% in 1714. Very tricky. The next year was a Jacobite rebellion. And they purchased and went to Thunnock. We do not know who was the architect of Thunnock, but it was red brick before. <coughs> and um, they went to live there. And it's interesting looking at some of the pictures of people who were around at that particular time because they're human, they're, they're like us, and not so distant. And this is what uh, Gainsborough more or less looked like, land-wise. Um, this is a land map, a terrier map, and so forth. And here you've got the little town, almost like a village, really. And you can see that the old village is here, um, just along the trend. And then you've got all this land up here. You've got the prairie up here, where the lords of the manor used to hunt and so forth. And then it was parceled up. And th this is what their land would have looked like in the 18th century and throughout. And this is a visual one, 1747, of the town. And you can see the hills, the hills nestled Gainsborough beautifully, but the trouble with the hills is water, because of course the water came down and do still come down at quite a rate, um, even with modern drainage uh, and so forth. We've now built on the hill, as you know. But look here, we've got the beautiful parish church, that medieval tower that Henry VIII would have looked upon. And the church, of course, is interesting because it, that is a, the only surviving medieval feature of it. And nearby, you've got the hall as well. And if you can see, this is the river. Uh, this is the river. And see how close it is to, to the hall. This is a bit of land. This was known as the Gainsborough Pool, um, where the boats and so forth uh, dock. The, the, the chapel and church, uh, the Lord stays uh, was here, that the Lord of the Manor had, uh, and so forth. And of course, the bend and, and so forth is still with us. Um, but it, but it's, it looks very much like a village. And here's a bit of a close up. We've got the, the windmill that burnt down and on uh, near the Hickman Hill Hotel. And here you've got a lovely like a church tower and that classical design wedded to it. 
and here you've got the 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 old hall and here you've got the kitchen and you've got some buildings a building there added on and it looks quite um, it's great uh, uh, i must say and this is another uh, um, sketch this is the sort of thing i would do if i was doing a town museum uh, and you can locate these these or identify these this is the parish church and here you've got the old hall and the interesting thing about this this is 18th century is the um, courtyard now i have always argued that the mark yard served both as a mark yard and an outer courtyard and that you go through into the inner courtyard the argument for one on the on the north side I'm not completely convinced about. Um, there are no proofs on either side, granted, but um, you have to look at different things and go by the circumstantial evidence uh, as such. It makes more sense this way than the other way. But anyway, um, but here you've got the, the town and you've got market, church, um, church street. So it's a very small village in many cases that we're dealing with. And I've done this deliberately because there's the church look and there's the <coughs> mark yard and so forth. These buildings are on Lord Street and I reckon that that will be the Hickman Arms, which is now solicitor's office, um, Bell Wilkinson and Dawson, although I know they've changed their name uh, on the corner there. <coughs> And here's another view of what Gainsborough looked like uh, in the 18th century. This is the, 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 uh, the hall. And here's the Lord Stave, Chapel Stave and so forth. And as you can see, the river is very, very important to the economy of the town. And of course, Gainsborough is the most in, in, inside port in the country until Gould snatched it from us. Um, and, oops. And um, here I'm turning around. And um, this was very important. Everything that came from London, destined for Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire, would come this way on, and vice versa from Derbyshire and so forth. So Josiah Wedgwood, uh, these people making their potteries and all that sort of coal and everything would come um, this way on, because of course the roads were as good as what the roads are today, so, you know, um, very poor indeed. So we rely very much on the um, river. And this is the old hall in the 18th century, not to scale, not to scale, but it does have some interesting feature, which is this. This is a staircase. Okay, and why would they want a staircase on the south? On, on this side uh, of the courtyard and so forth. But in the 18th century, there was a theatre in the Great Hall. Ormondy, Joe Cornby, um, had a linen factory which he gave up. Um, and Mr. West took on part of the lease for a theatre in there. And they have um, seating for people like me, the poor, down it. But if you were wealthy, you could sit on a, in a gallery, and how to get there, you went up this staircase. Okay. This is a view of the hall from the parish church, and here you've got this beautiful um, uh, really from, the, from the, the top of the church, and that's how we know roughly the date. Um, for, for this picture because of the, um, of the classical church that we have. And here you've got the Mark Yard. And I often think of this as Gainsborough House in, in miniature, if you like. Um, uh, and here you can see the, the, the vessels, the, the vessels on the river, uh, parked up and so forth. All look very idyllic. <coughs> Now, we're in Church Street here, and this is an important 18th century property 
the more reasons than just being 18th century. Um, and it would be lovely to get rid of these shops and restore it fully to what it is, because we know what it looked like uh, and so forth. This is a very important 18th century property. It, um, let's give us some clues. You can see that the person who lived here was of substance. They had a ability. And this is an archway, rather a large archway as well. You'd get a carriage through, but many carriages through wood and wood. This was a wood wool stapler. Mr. Sharples was the owner of this property. He was the wood stapler. And he lived here, and at the back, he had his um, factory, which was, uh, you know, dealing with the wool uh, and so forth. But he lived in this beautiful townhouse. And of course, it wasn't really the collecting in the 18th century or the early 18th century properties to show your roof. So you built little walls and hide your roof, you know. And here we've got it. And it's a beautiful decorated window here. It really is exquisite. Okay? But it is an important building. And um, I'll tell you why as we go through the pictures, I hope. <coughs> Can you see the archway? This archway? Look at the state of it there. Actually, the state of it. And this was what it was like in about 72 or whatever. And um, a lot, I mean, people looking at it wouldn't say the best thing to do is pull it down and all the rest of it. Um, it actually belonged to, uh, uh, it still does belong to the Gainsborough and District Civic Society, which I am now just in, have been for quite a few years. But this was before my time in membership. But what to do with it, and um, the Civic Society turned to the um, Urban District Council for help, but under the legislation they couldn't give any monies to help and support it because nobody had designated what they called a, a conservation area for the town. And therefore the Urban District Council, if they wanted these grants from the government, they had to designate an area, a, 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 a conservation area. So, as a result of this building, part of the town was designated for conservation. We are in one already. This is a, this is the heritage hub, as it were. The church, of course, is included. The old hall is included, and quite a few of the 18th-century properties, which I hope I'll get to tonight, as well. So. This is an important building in more ways than one, you know, so we owe it a great deal, I mean, you know, it, it, in that sense. And you can, what is it today? Well, the let off is um, tenements. Um, that's where people live in them and pay rent, and they pay a ground rent to, to the Gainesville District Civic Society. And then it looks glorious, doesn't it? Because the money did come in and it was done up. And uh, unfortunately, these are private and owned. And, but it would be lovely to restore the whole thing, uh, go the whole hog and so forth. So that is a dream that I have that it will, because it is a glorious building indeed. And that building brings me on to. Um, the candelabra in the parish church. That too is lovely. If you, you know, go in and have a look at it and admire it. It really is lovely. It's three tier, it's twenty odd candles, whatever it is. And it is absolutely wonderful. And it was given to the church in seventeen twenty three and it predates the existing church. So it could have been in the former church, and then um, reused, as it were. And the person who gave it was a John Wilmer. And where did he live? He lived across the road in the wall stables. 
Mr. Sharples built it, and Tobel have lived in it, and the name goes with the job, doesn't it, with the trade. And, uh, and this is in the possession, it was in the possession of the Friends, and then when British Town Council took over in 79, all our pictures, archives and so forth were taken to, to Lincoln. And I think we get uh, an idea of what it looked like. And I think that's interesting. Um, not many people will have seen that. Um, it's a very rare um, picture. And um, uh, portraits of him. It shows you the wealth that they had to even have a portrait done as well. So that's quite nice. But do go in and have a look at that uh, Canberra. It's beautiful. And here we're back at the old, uh, the old hall. Here, you see, they've covered it over. So if it's inclement and raining or whatever, you know, you, you, you looked after pretty well to go up there. And uh, there was a medieval porch there. It <coughs> disappeared. Uh, but uh, then when they got rid of the uh, theatre, about 1849 or so, they took away all of this. And, so forth. and we've only got, I think, two of the sketches that uh, you've seen tonight that actually show that there was that kind of porch. And of course, living at the Old Hall, when the Hickmans moved over to Thanark, where the Abingdons, the Earls of Abingdon, I always get on about the Earls of Abingdon, and this was the third, uh, this is with, um, the third, this is the fourth. The, four, the third Earl lived here, with his young family, and this was one of his young sons, who in 1760 became the fourth Earl of Abingdon, and he was very important to us. He lived in his quarters somewhere <coughs> above and so forth. And the fourth Earl, of course, was a great friend of Haydn and Bach, and he was also a great supporter of the colonists. He felt that they had been badly, shamefully treated, and really talk was better than jaw. Um, I, I know I've talked about the Abingdons before, but they, the Americans do think a great deal of the fourth Earl of Abingdon, and we don't make much of him here, which is very sad. This chap was one of the grammar school governors. When we lived here, we were here for probably 14, 15, 16 years, I think, something like that. Um, they were here because Cape Burton was part of their estate, for one thing. They were related to the Hickmans, and these are Berties, the Berties of Grimsdorf Castle. And um, they still exist within the peerage. They're Catholic, they remain Catholic. And um, he was one of the governors of the grammar school uh, in, in the early period of the 18th century. They look fine, don't they? And here's Thanuk again, um, the ivy. Queen Mary would never have approved of the ivy. Um, much older. This is my favourite view. There was quite a substantial amount of the bank and sides uh, and so forth. And now we come to the church. And this is what the church looked like in the early part of the 18th century, right up to... Um, the 1730s. And as you can see, you've got the 15th century tower. This is the south aspect. Um, here you've got a south porch. And here you've got what I would probably call the chantry chapel of the boroughs that the Hickmans possibly used as well. Look at the state of it. There's a tree there. You know, it doesn't look in a very good state whatsoever. And that is the condition of Gainsborough's parish church. And it was decided that the best thing to do um, was, um, well, there are two courses, you could either repair it um, or pull it down and rebuild. They had a survey done by masons as well as architects and it was decided to pull it down and build again. And the interesting thing about it is this, that it was decided really to keep the tower, which I'm jolly well pleased about. Um, they wanted to keep, uh, no, uh, I'll I'm racing my story. They kept the tower, 
And the people, the people of Games were, um, uh, the church wanted the whole thing rebuilding, but not in the Gothic style. <laughs> the Gothic style had fell out of fashion. Uh, what was the, the, it was the classical or the Palladian style <coughs> that was the popular, the, the, the style that was acceptable in these days. And therefore they decided they wanted the whole thing in a classical design indeed. But keep, keep the tower. Um, so they have this architect called Francis Smith <coughs> from Warwick. And he um, did the survey of the property of the church and even the costings for the build. Now the interesting thing about Smith, and I think he's the most likely architect for this church is he wanted to keep the choir, the chancel, and the tower, and then build a new nave. But the people of Gainsborough and the church said, No, we want rid of the, um, the lot. 